department is better trained, better equipped, and better prepared than ever before. We've been able to do this because of uh, a vast amount of help we've gotten from many different partners, such as fire departments throughout the country, throughout the world. The National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, which has helped us tremendously in the last 10 years, and also our military. Many uh, young veterans who joined the military say they joined so because of the attacks on New York City, and in particular, the attacks on the FDNY. This outpouring of support has recommitted the department to ensuring that you have the safest working conditions possible. We've done that through safety initiatives, training initiatives, and fitness and wellness initiatives. View the video and help us to ensure that everyone goes home safely. On 9-11, we lost a lot of talent. We lost good members, we lost an all-star team. When I motivation go to work is that we owe it to them to be ready for the next event. And whether it's training, maintaining equipment, whatever it is, that tour, we owe it to them to do the right thing. Everything we do has the firefighter's safety as our paramount concern. Our duty is to protect the lives of the public. That's what they expect, and that's what they deserve from us. But we need to do it safer. Our success is not measured solely in terms of our effectiveness. Effectiveness comes hand in hand with how safely we operate. When we look at the safety of our members, we look at three things. We look at health and wellness, training initiatives, and safety initiatives. This is a different era between terrorism, fire dynamics, fire growth. The fire ground today, it's changed on us. The fires are way more volatile than ever before. We're wearing more gear, we're heavier. So we have to be smarter, we have to be safer. We want you to take risks, you're firefighters, but we want you to do it safely. It's the smart firefighter that gets the job done, wears his protective gear properly, and comes home safe. Now you just captured it all. This department has made tremendous progress in terms of safety. Through the use of technology, through the use of our injury and accident reduction programs, the PPE we wear, and the training we get, this department is better and safer than it's ever been before. We are embracing technology to improve fire ground accountability. Some examples of those technology projects are the EFIS system, the electronic command board, and the pack tracker. It's called the electronic fire ground accountability system. This system allows the incident commander to instantly identify a member in distress when they key their emergency alert by name, company, and position. By having that information, the incident commander can send the fast truck to the unit's location and address the situation immediately. Starting with the first battalion chief on scene, he can plot where the units are on the fire ground. Before the deputy chief arrives, he can open up his command pad, a laptop, and be aware of where all the units are on the scene, and it increases situational awareness all around. Left hand on a device, right hand on a rope. The PSS system it consists of 50 feet of rope with a descending device that we wear in a pouch on our harness. It is there as a last resort. After making my search in the bedroom, there was a transmission given by the command that we needed to exit the third floor. I said, okay, that's me, I'm on the third floor, I gotta get out. So I was in a situation. It occurred to me that I, I have a, this tool that we've been trained to use, uh, the personal safety system. Just like we trained at The Rock, I went through the, the motions and it worked. I didn't appreciate this tool before. Now, after being in a situation where I needed it, I would tell another firefighter that I know you think it's a little bulky, I know it weighs a couple of pounds. When you need it, it can save your life. I would have jumped out the window if I didn't have the thing. That's, that's a fact. R&D is, is a unit of safety, it's part of safety. What they do is they check out uh, new equipment, new ideas, new technologies that are brought out, and they test them and they try to figure out what would work for us in the fire department and the FDNY and what wouldn't work. Firefighters need to know that R&D is an active place. We have over 40 projects ongoing right now. Members of Research and Development have reached out to the greatest minds in technology and have partnered together to create projects like EFAS, like the Pack Tracker, like the improvements to the Handy Talkie, like the Emergency Alert Button, that are making firefighter accountability a greater reality every day. 
now we get a lot of video into the firehouse, we get a lot of specialized training into the firehouse. We now have a program where we're going to be able to push out a tremendous amount of training material to each firehouse. We call it the kiosk program so that firefighters in the firehouse and in the EMS stations are going to be able to gather around the kiosk and get safety materials sent directly to them right from the administration, right from training, right from the safety bureau. I believe that our firefighters in the FDNY are better trained and better equipped than ever before to deal with the fire ground situations that they have to deal with today. One of our initiatives is the Accident Reduction Program. Firefighting is a dangerous profession. We do all this training, we have all this specialized gear to keep us safe in a fire, but we have to get to the fire safely, and that's where the Accident Reduction Program comes in. We talk about seatbelt safety and aggressive driving. When we give these drills and I see heads nodding and the members looking at each other, nodding in agreement, it gives me great satisfaction because they understand what, where I'm coming from. And accidents are down and you can't argue with the results. One of our initiatives is injury reduction. So we developed an injury reduction program where FDNY members had a unique opportunity to hear firsthand accounts from other firefighters, the chilling circumstances surrounding their life-altering, debilitating, and in most cases, career-ending injuries. Having given this presentation over a hundred times, I can tell you, it was never the same. The DVD inspired new conversation every time. The program itself was designed to address a number of safety initiatives, but first members needed to recognize the need to change our culture. And that process began around a kitchen table with open discussion. And these conversations need to continue. Smoke was pushing from the top of the door at the corner apartment. The door was closed but not locked. We decided to make a push. While the engine was stretching, we got in ahead of the line. We heard transmission of a, the wind on the floor above. The roof man gave a very good report. We got 15 feet in and I found a crib, there was no baby, and conditions just deteriorated. It's kind of like a little bit of a punch in the face made me stop dead in my tracks. And it was the high heat, real loud noise, it was kind of like a freight train. It was almost, almost paralyzing mentally and physically. We've been to a lot of fires in the projects, and this one was different. We've been trying to learn more about how wind actually affects fires inside structures. And we've lost five firefighters to these types of fires in fireproof multiple dwellings. Between Vandalia Avenue, uh, Tracy Towers in the Bronx, Park Avenue in the Bronx, this event had occurred time and time again, and we paid too high of a toll for those uh, events. We were able to get a grant and partner with Polytech University to do that research. We got buildings available to us on Governor's Island, we set fires in these buildings, and we brought in NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, who actually set up these apartments and these burns so that they were able to get all the scientific data out of what went on in these fires under wind-driven conditions. And with that information, we were able to literally change the way we looked at fires and our tactics on how we deal with these fires. As an incident commander down in Rockaway, when I had those maydays, it's a really helpless feeling standing out in the street and knowing members are not only lost or missing, but they're being affected by the fire. They are being affected by the heat. They are not only asking for help, they're screaming for help. The words were, we're burning, Chief, help us. That's a longing only feeling. We were able to develop solutions on how to deal with it differently. The fire window blankets to stop the wind, or the curtain, the fire curtain, the high-rise nozzle, to hit it from the floor below when it's out of reach of a towel ladder or maybe a, a, a hand line from another window. Breaching the walls from the adjoining apartments if that's possible, just playing some water into the fire room to knock down the fire so that we can now advance through the apartment door and do a direct attack on the seat of the fire. These are all things we've learned in the past couple of years. We never knew it, um, but we know it now. And it's for the safety of firefighters without a doubt. FDNY has come a long way since 9-11. Um, we actually have a terrorism unit now. At the Center for Terrorism and Disaster Preparedness, the FDNY looks at the current and national and international threat, and we develop plans, policies, and procedures to prepare for that threat. Of the 39 plots in the United States since post 
13 of those have targeted New York City. We looked at training from the probationary firefighter all the way up to the chief officer. We wanted them to do hazard assessment as part of their size up. And this way they could recognize something being out of place or being a hazard which they don't normally encounter. And that played out on our Times Square incident. Through my training, um, I realized that uh, this was no ordinary response. Um, you can't take anything for granted, uh, especially a seemingly routine car fire in this case ended up being uh, an attempted car bomb. The FDNY Center for Terrorism and Disaster Preparedness um, was, was very, very helpful with, with the statements and memos that they issued. Um, Watchline was a huge resource for us. Uh, it comes down about once a week and uh, it just basically tells you uh, what's been happening in the world as far as terrorism and disasters. Our operation was reminiscent of the uh, attempted London bombing. I think that had a lot to do with our decision and, and, and our drills. Um, it def definitely uh, helped out. What I learned was uh, how crucial situational awareness is and uh, how important training is, um, especially for these types of incidents where uh, we're not doing these things every day, but you need to be ready 100% of the time. So uh, it's only through proper training and drilling can we operate efficiently and safely. Heart attacks are the number one killer among firefighters. Training is very important to counteract the effects of heart disease and to meet the increased demands uh, of the gear and what we're required to do to save lives and property. If you can't get yourself up eight flights of stairs, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna be an effective firefighter. You're not gonna be able to do your job. And more importantly, you're gonna create an unsafe condition. We're here to offer our members every encouragement, every tool that is necessary for them to be physically fit, to be able to do this job safely and effectively, and retire from this job with their health intact. You know, if we have an injury, we're gonna get it taken care of medically. But we can have emotional injuries too. If someone is emotionally affected, we need to make sure that we help them, and we can use the counseling service to assist them. Bureau of Health Services wants you to be well. We have a commitment to ensuring that you remain well. The work you do is too important not to take care of you as individuals. Your bunker gear is an important part of protecting you, but the inner part, the individual who wears that bunker gear, is the most important part. We need your physical and mental well-being to be maintained, and we need your commitment to working with us to keep you safe. The big thing that you should remember about the counseling unit is that you're going to get professional care. It's going to be confidential, and we're not going to quit until we make you better. It's a great time to be in the Marine Division. We have a lot of new equipment. We have uh, two 140-foot, very advanced fireboats. We have a 65-foot boat different mission, again very advanced, as well as uh, small boats, all new boats. We have the ability to carry more people away from an incident and bring more firefighters to the incident. We've expanded our pumping capability twice uh, what it was in the past. The older boats would pump up to 20,000 gallons a minute. Uh, the new boats pump well over 50,000 gallons a minute. 9-11, the old fire boats were the only source of water for the first couple of days because the hydrant system was locked out. So if, God forbid, something happens like that again, we have the ability to pump more than enough water. What we've done is a tiered response. We have small boats to, to, for quick response to pull people out of the water, to help people immediately, and then we can move it up each level as, as needed. That's the biggest difference in the Marine Division, that we can handle anything from a small incident in the guy in the water to, to a major catastrophe. We can handle it, and we couldn't do that before. Katrina was a great success. Based on the lessons learned there, we've improved the incident management team, and we are currently prepared to respond internally to New York City or any place else in the nation. Seatbelts have been a problem nationwide in the fire service for a very long time. We here in the FDNY have also recognized that as being a major safety impediment and a safety issue. To that end, we have worked very, very hard to come up with a new initiative and a new seatbelt. Well, our job recognized the problem, said we can't put on seatbelts if they're not going to fit. We're talking about a fireman with all kinds of new gear on, rope, tools, harness, flashlight. It's basically impossible to put your seatbelt on and then have it retract off. And now every apparatus on a job is being retrofitted with a new type of seatbelt where we will be able to wear them. And I think it'll take some time, but eventually everyone in the fire department will be wearing a seatbelt. Uh, the PPE the FDNY uses, I think, is the, uh, it's a very good mix of thermal protection and weight 
on the firefighter. It's nice to see, since 1994, we're continually looking at this, this bunker program to see that we, how we can improve it to protect the firefighters. And what I found unique back in 1994 is they took my dad offline as a rescue captain. You know, he was in the busiest company in the city here, and he volunteered, I'm sure, himself to come offline. He felt it was that important to come off uh, and away from his company, which was hard to pull him away from, from his company. And he put thousands of hours into this program, and uh, we've, we've benefited. It was said from the people that were doing the Bunker Gear program that uh, he did it for a couple of reasons. To protect his sons, who are now on the job, and to make sure that other firefighters in the FDNY will continually be safe. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Um, what I mean by is, we, I heard female screaming. I've never heard screaming like this before. It was blood curling. Uh, we, we figured we had somebody trapped inside the rear bedroom. I started to try to crawl in under the flames, and the, the officer said to me, he says, I don't think you're gonna make it. I don't think you have the time. I says, I think I got it. I think I got it. Because I was so fixed on, on the, uh, the screaming. And with that, uh, everything went real orange, real fast and I can feel the heat now on the top of my head, through the hood, through the helmet, and around my face. That's where that, you know, that the room then flashed. I had second degree burns on both ears and my hands. I was ecstatic that, you know, the gear actually worked as advertised. And this was one of those things where we weren't backing out from that. We, we thought we had a, a track victim, we can hear it. We, everything led us to believe that, you know, we needed to get, get, get somebody, and this is, you know, New York City Fine, it's what we do. We were all wearing our gear the, the way we were, we were supposed to, and uh, it paid off. Just, I have my ears, I have my hands, you know, if I ever have kids, I'll be able to play with the kids, and you know, nobody's ever gonna ask me any questions of what happened to your ears, Just, you know. Thank God I was wearing it the way I was supposed to. We arrived as an engine company, first new engine company, at a uh, four-story uh, multiple dwelling. It was started, uh, it was a torched fire, it was a uh, uh, stairs, started on the stairway and went up the entire stairs to the roof. I started feeling some burning on my head a little bit. I had my hood around my neck, um, not completely up on my head. I got hit by something heavier from the top of the uh, bulkhead, it knocked my helmet off. I had third degree burns. I had skin grafts. I was almost put off the job. But more than that, it was the helpless feeling I had being outside, not being with the members on the hose line, able to take care of them as I think that is my duty to do. And I would have been there with them if I had my gear on properly. I don't want anybody to have that helpless feeling like I had that day. Wear your PPE. I get geared up, go through my motions, put my hood on, Bunker gear on, flaps down, mask up. Start my search. The guy's still yelling, hollering. I followed the left wall. It led me into this kitchen and passed through the kitchen into the back room where the guy was at the back window. Look out the back window, no fire escapes, no portable ladders. Make our way through the back bedroom, through the kitchen again. Get to that front room. The front room just totally roaring with fire. Floor to ceiling. It was like somebody turned the lights on. I just went as fast as I could with this guy and ran right to that window, threw him out, and I jumped out because I was feeling, you know, we were burning up. I got first degree burns on my face and then I got second degree burns behind my, uh, my left shoulder. If I had learned anything from this fire, it would be as far as uh, wearing my gear properly, I like to follow a routine to put my gear on. Put my hood up, my flaps down my mask on properly before I, before I commit to a, a fire apartment. When you drill about only going after a life hazard that you know, not taking uh, risks unless you know there's somebody there, and in this case there was somebody there, and that might be why I, I went as far as I did. But I could go as far as I did because I wore my bunker gear properly. We went to the floors above, uh, four stores, made searches, and uh, we ran out of air. Uh, I needed a little help getting to the ambulance. I didn't, I didn't, just didn't feel right. Took a couple of hits of oxygen and I was out. I was airlifted from Kings County to the hyperbaric chamber. Uh, I was given last rites. Looking back at it now, when we were running low on air, um, I, I would say the move would have been to notify um, the chief that we have to leave, we're, we're running low of air, 
and we need relief up here. If we ourselves become part of the problem, we are doing nothing more than adding to an already bad situation. Back in the day, we didn't understand the importance of our personal protective clothing and our SCBA. And the reason why is that we had a mindset that we go into our fire, we save our mask for times when we get in trouble. And as a result of that, I didn't wear it certain, certain times during the fire, and I didn't wear it during overhaul. And as a result of not wearing them at those different times, I came down with cancer. It is important that not only you wear your personal protective clothing, but you clean your personal protective clothing each and every time. It's important that you wear your mask, not only during the job, but you wear your mask during overhaul. You come back, it's important to take a shower, to, to clean up, to get all the carcinogen particles off your skin. These are the things that you have to do to protect yourself. My backup man and myself, we both, you know, were yelling to each other, we were getting burned, but we knew there were people above. We knew we had to keep pushing in. I spent uh, two weeks in the burn unit and then about five months uh, with medical leave and light duty. The night I got back to the firehouse and I was putting my gear out on the rig and I, I saw my face piece and it had swirls on the, on the left side and it was melted. It made me feel really grateful and really lucky and that, uh, you know, I did do everything right. I did, I bunkered up. I prepared in the best way I could have. I, I used my training and if I didn't, it could have been a lot worse and luckily I was safe. You know, it definitely reinforced my training for me and that to make sure to take the time to to you know put my hood on and to do all the little things to make sure that I will be safe. Wear your gear as you're supposed to, as we're trained to, to wear it. Your hood up, your collar up, your gloves are on, you know, your chin strap on, chin strap tight. Serious fires, dangerous fires will always happen in this city. There's no way around it. We have to be prepared to do that type of work. It's not going to change. There's no substitution for realistic training. And here at The Rock, we have some of the most realistic training our members can be exposed to prior to going out into the field. I'm always urging our company officers and encouraging them to continue the company drills. It's such an important component of each tour. Once you roll out on the fire truck, you must know how to operate every piece of equipment on that, on that fire apparatus. And if you don't, uh, it's a shame on you. Terrorist attacks on 9-11 hit us really hard. From the time I went into the World Trade Center until the time I came out of the rubble, the world changed. We were beat up. We lost a tremendous amount of talent, a tremendous amount of experience. No doubt on 9-11, this department took a big hit. We were down, but we were never out. We didn't give up. There were leaders that arose that day. I can remember it being dark and windy, and then it changed. There was a little bit of light, and it was a chief standing up gathering guys around him and leading us back. We were faced with enormous challenges and grief and bereavement, and we overcame all of that, and we continued to fight fires. We fought fires on September 12, 2001. We fought fires on September 11, 2001. Firemen were able to function under those conditions and still think of their fellow man throughout the day, knowing that they were in grave danger. I was never so proud to be a fireman as I was that day. From the ground up, this department has rebuilt itself. We got up, we brushed ourselves off, and we became a better and stronger department. The biggest change in the fire department over the last 10 years has been the younger members becoming seasoned firefighters through training and hard work. That's when I knew we were going to be fine when I saw the younger members stepping up. Come a long way, you know, from, from tragedy, you know, untold tragedy. And uh, we're back, you know, we're back stronger than ever. For the darkest day in our department came so many other things that was better for the department. As a department, we come to work every day fully aware that this could happen again. And we train to that end. And we take these guys seriously. They don't, they're not messing around, and neither are we. I'm very proud to be part of this project that brings the FDNY and the National Fallen Firefighters together to promote a way forward so that everyone can go home. 
This is the time I think is going to be remembered where we got the safety initiatives right. We hear a lot about honoring the guys that passed before us. And what does that mean? That means we need to carry their legacy, their vision, on what they wanted this job to be. All we can do is be our best. All we can do is train hard, train safely, operate safely. And every time we go out the door, we go out in their run and we want to make them proud. What's it like working for the FDNY? It's a dream come true. No one could ever take that away from you. You're a New York City firefighter for life. To come to work for 31 years and love your job, it just makes life great. I come to work and I pinch myself. I'm getting to live out my dream. It has been a gift and an honor to be part of this great organization. I've been fortunate enough to be with the FDNY for 26 years now, and I could never say that I did not want to go to work one tour. There's no place else I'd rather be, and there's no other job I'd rather have. It's very reassuring to know that the dedication, the aggressiveness of the guys you work with, when you need help, they're coming. They're not going to stop, no matter what. The men and women of the FDNY are the best people I've ever met, ever had the pleasure of working with. Hands down. I want to thank you for everything you do. Let's work together to make sure everyone goes home. FDNY, this is the greatest job in the world. You new members have big shoes to fill and traditions to uphold, but I want you to do it safely. Your bunker gear is important, but you're more important. Stay safe, be well, take care of yourselves. You have to remember how many members have put their time, effort, and in some cases, their lives, to make this a safer job. This is a great job. Stay prepared, work hard, make sure you go home safe to your family. We say we never forget, but let's prove it. Let's drill, let's train, and let's all go home safe. All members should make their health and fitness their number one priority. Stay alert, wear your PPE, so you can go home to your loved ones. It's an honor to be a member of the FDNY. I'm proud to work side by side with all of you. Let's all go home safe. Take care of yourself. Stay safe.